Hello friends, Kelsey here from Seed and Sparrow Homestead. Welcome back to my channel. If you've been around and seen a few of my videos before, then you know I've got a goal this year to put more shelf-stable convenience type food on my pantry shelf and into my freezer. So that is what we are working on today. I am focusing on some pantry meals right now. So I have four meal in a jar recipes to share with you all. And I'm hoping as well to give you the encouragement and confidence you need to get started with pressure canning. I know a lot of times there is fear surrounding pressure canning and people are really uncomfortable having one in their home thinking that they are gonna cause damage to their kitchen. I just wanna show you how simple and easy it is and it's super safe when it is done properly. So I wanna share with you how to do that today so that you can start doing this if you aren't already. So let's go over all of the tools we need as well as the ingredients we're using and I'm gonna go over my pressure canner with you all and let you check that out. So let's get started. All right, so tools needed for today's job. This is a canning funnel, and I am going to be using this just, it helps to make less of a mess, get the food down in the jar more easily. Um, ideally, I would be using some wide mouth jars. It's just so much easier to get your hand in and work with the food. I don't have any available right now. They're all in use, so I'm just using what I have, and that is a regular mouth jar. Works totally fine, just not as easy to get your hand in there. Um, these are warm to the touch. We're going to be adding in hot liquid, so we don't want to use cold jars. Otherwise, you could have a thermal sh shock and they could break. So we don't want that. And then I've got new canning lids here. These are just washed in warm soapy water. Um, I've got my debubbling tool here, as well as a head spacing tool. So this is what I use to get all of the air bubbles out. You want to use something that's either wooden or plastic. And then this ensures we're using the correct amount of headspace in these jars. That is very important. And then the last thing I've got here is my jar lifter. So let's just make sure we don't burn our fingers. So that is what we're using there. I do have a little bit of white vinegar here to clean the rims of the jar off, as well as a washcloth. And then other than that, let's just go over all of the ingredients we are using today. Okay, so here is what we are working with. I have some minced garlic, chopped onions, celery, carrots, and potatoes. The carrots and the potatoes are both peeled and washed. You wanna make sure you don't have any peels left on those two items. And then for our meat, we have some beef cubes, cubed chicken, and some cubed pork back there. Then we also have some sliced mushrooms, we need a little bit of tomato paste, some brown sugar, salt and pepper, Worcestershire, and some white wine. Now some of these recipes call for more seasonings. I choose not to put them in my jars. I will add them when we actually go to eat it. I personally am not a fan of a whole lot of spices in canned things, especially pressure canned things because of the amount of time that they are in the pressure canner. These will all be pressure canned for 90 minutes. Um, I find it really intensifies their flavor and I'm not always fond of the outcome. So seasoning is always something you can add later. So besides the salt, a little bit of pepper, I'm not putting any other spices in. I will do that later. The only other ingredient I forgot to mention, back on the stove I have some broth boiling. That is going to be the hot liquid that we're adding to all of these jars to get the correct headspace. So the four recipes we are doing today, uh, we've got a pot roast, some beef stroganoff, chicken and gravy, and some pulled pork. So those are our four meals. And all of today's recipes are being pulled from this book. This is the all new ball book of canning and preserving. It no longer has a cover because my two year old decided he wanted to shred it one day. So rest in peace to the cover of this book. Um, but I'll put a picture on the screen and I will link it for you down below. This is the two ball books for preserving are for canning and preserving are my go to's. That's what I always use for all of my recipes. Um, I definitely think that you should have them on your shelf. They are great resources to have. And this one in particular, if I can find the page, has this whole section here on variations of meal and jar recipes. 
So, um, lots of good recipes besides those in this book. Um, I love them. So definitely go check them out. That being said, obviously all of these meals are safe and approved. I am a pretty buy the book canner. Um, that is what I feel comfortable with. It's what I feel comfortable feeding my family and sharing and teaching others with. No shade to anyone who is not a buy the book canner. I am a firm believer in it is your kitchen, it's your rules, you do your own research, but everything that you see on this channel will always be safe tested recipes. With that being said, um, I'm gonna take you back here and I'm gonna show you the canner that I have. So this is my lovely canner. This is an All-American, I believe it's the model 921. And um, I chose this one. The two big ones on the market are either your All-American or your Presto canner. Um, I have never used a Presto canner before, so I can't speak to how it is. But I chose this one based off of a lot of research and reviews. This thing is just a tank. It's like heirloom quality. I can pass this on to my daughter and she can pass this on to her daughter. Um, and it just felt super safe to me. Um, like I said, it's built like a tank and it has these reinforced little locking, oh you can see that, little hooks here. So when you line it up, it goes right underneath these lips here and then you have all of these screws that you tighten over the top. So I love it. I've had no issues with it. I'd highly recommend it. The only thing is it is quite a large investment. I think these are around 400 US dollars and this is like the medium size. There's bigger sizes and looking back now if we had the funds I probably would have gone with the next bigger size as long as you have the clearance for it on your stove top. Um, this microwave here prevents me from getting anything bigger, uh, which is another reason why I went with this size. But with the bigger size, you can, I believe, don't quote me on it, but I'm pretty sure you can stack quart jars so you can get twice as many done in one pressure canning round. This only allows you to stack one quart jar at a time. I can stack two pint jars though, and it comes with these racks here. So you put your first layer of pint jars down, stick this on top, and then your second layer of pint jars. So I love this, I highly recommend it, but of course you have to do with you know, whatever you're able to, whatever your budget allows. I'm very thankful at the time we had the money for this. So this is the pressure canner I use. Um, inside, the plate goes down on the bottom, the thing with the holes there. And then you can kind of see where that dark line ends. That is where I fill the, um, the water to. Uh, in your manual, for whatever canner you have, it'll tell you how much uh, water to put in. So I believe this says two inches and that is where it goes. You don't submerge your jars in water when you're pressure canning. That is a big difference between pressure canning and water bath canning. You need your jars to be completely covered when water bath canning. For this, um, it is really about the steam and the pressure that builds up in here, which achieves the temperature needed to ensure that these foods um, are safe to consume. The only other thing to note about the pressure canner um, comes with a weighted gauge. It does have the dial here, which keeps track of the pressure. Um, but here at my elevation, I can at 10 pounds of pressure. You will have to check that out, whatever your elevation is as to what your manual says. So 10 pounds of pressure, um, that will go on here later, but I will show you that as the process unfolds. I am filling up my canner to that two inch mark and I am going to get this to almost a simmer. I want it to be right at a simmer when I go to add my jars in. All right, so the first meal I'm working on is my uh, chicken and gravy. So I have two pounds of uh, cubed chicken in this bowl here and then I need to add one cup of chopped celery, a cup of peeled and chopped potatoes and one cup of onions. Now I don't think I mentioned each one of these recipes is enough for two quart jars or four pint jars. So I am choosing to do all quart jars 
Um, and I think I have enough to do the stroganoff, the chicken and gravy, and the pot roast. Do two jars each of those. I think I only have enough of the pork, the pulled pork, to do one quart jar. So that'll actually work out perfectly because my canner will hold seven quart jars. So that is how much we are making. So for this, I need two, yeah, two teaspoons of salt and it says one teaspoon of black pepper. I'm only going to do a half teaspoon because I think it just, things can get really peppery and I can always add more pepper later. Um, and then I'm going to do four tablespoons of white wine. All right, so I'm just going to get all of this mixed up and then I'm going to divide it between two quart jars and this recipe is done. Moving on to pot roast in a jar. So I've got two pounds of cubed uh, beef in here. I'm adding one cup of peeled and chopped potatoes. I need a cup of chopped celery, or that was carrots. And then I need a half cup of chopped celery and one cup of onions. Again, I'm adding in two teaspoons of salt. It's one teaspoon per quart jar, a half teaspoon per pint jar. I'm gonna add in two cloves worth of minced garlic. Then we're just gonna get this one all mixed up. And we've got our second recipe ready to go. This last week already has proved to me that I need these meals on my pantry shelf and I need to get some freezer meals into the freezer. We had some really warm weather, which is completely unseasonal and slightly concerning that it is this warm already, but that got me itching to be outside. So me and the kids spent most of the time this last week outside and I found myself not wanting to come back inside to start on dinner. So it would have been really nice to have some of these convenience meals to just pull out and warm up and have dinner ready to go. So I am super excited to be putting these on my pantry shelf. All right, third recipe. So I've got two pounds again of cubed beef. I'm gonna add in one cup of sliced mushrooms. And I need one cup of chopped onion. I need two cloves worth of minced garlic. And then we need four tablespoons of tomato paste. Four tablespoons of Worcestershire, or however you say that word. That's how I've always said it, and I have felt completely comfortable saying it that way. And then just like the others, two teaspoons of salt. And we're gonna add in about a half teaspoon of pepper. Again, I don't like pepper in large quantities. Canned, it just gets too intense for me. Like I said, if you go to make these recipes and you see all of the seasoning that um, the recipe is calling for. That's not something that has to do with the safety of the recipe. It's just for flavor. And like I said, I'd rather add those seasonings when we go to eat the meal rather than have um, them get too intense during the canning process. So I am just leaving them out. All right, for the pulled pork, I failed to get all the ingredients out for that one. I forgot that it was going to need some more things. So I'm gonna grab some ketchup, uh, some apple cider vinegar. I need to go get some more Worcestershire sauce, some mustard and honey. So I'm gonna go get those things and then we'll get them in the bowl. All right, so I've got all my ingredients. I weighed out my pork and I really only have enough for a half recipe. So for one quart jar. So I am going to cut everything in half here. So I'm adding in three quarter cup, yeah, three quarter cup of onion, three quarter cup of ketchup, quarter cup of light brown sugar packed down, an eighth cup of 
apple cider vinegar. That needs to be 5% acidity. One tablespoon of Worcestershire. One tablespoon of brown mustard. Tablespoon of honey. And one and a half garlic cloves minced. So we're gonna get all of this mixed together and we will have all our recipes ready to go into the jars. Okay, I didn't realize it, but this pork mixture is supposed to be heated before it goes into the jar, so we need to bring this to a boil. So I'm gonna get this in a pot and get it over on the stove. All right, while we are waiting on the pork mixture to come to a boil, we have to let it simmer then for five minutes. I'm gonna get all my other jars filled with the other recipes. So my jars are warm. We are gonna be putting in some hot liquid, some hot broth on top of them, and they're going into a hot canner. So you always wanna keep your jars the same temperature as your liquid in your canner. So I'm just gonna divide these recipes because they were for two quart jars. So I'm just gonna divide them in half. All of these recipes call for one inch of head space. So that is one inch of empty space above the contents of the jar and below the lid. So I'm going to fill up all of my jars to right about this rim, this bottom rim right here. That's approximately one inch. I will use my head spacing tool um, a little bit later to make sure that my liquid is right where it needs to be but I don't want any of these contents to float up higher than that so I kind of stop filling it right around that lower rim. So my head spacing tool and my debubbler just snapped on me. So I'm gonna go get a skewer and use that to debubble. All right, so I'm just gonna use some skewers to try and get out any air bubbles. So I just go around the edges. And then you adjust for head space with some more liquid if need be. So for one inch right here, you rest this little piece on the rim and you wanna make sure that this is flat and level and that it just meets the liquid in the jar. And you don't want any big pieces of like solid food up above that liquid line. So this is perfect. I am going to take my washcloth and some of my vinegar and clean this rim up. You always want to make sure you have clean rims, otherwise any food residue that is left there can prevent your lid from sealing. So make sure that these are good and clean. This one's pretty sticky with that brown sugar and honey in this recipe. So I'm just going to take our lid then, put it on this guy. So we're gonna grab a band, which I did not have ready, place it over top, make sure your lid is centered, and then we're tightening it to fingertip tight. We're not getting our wrist involved, we're not cranking at it, just as tight as your fingers can make it. You can over tighten these and then you can have a lid buckle and we don't want that because then you're gonna have a product that's not shelf stable and is gonna have to be used up right away. So we wanna make sure that we are doing everything properly, you are filling to the correct amount of headspace, wiping your rims, using new lids, and tightening to fingertip tight. So this one is ready to go in the canner. Again, just going in with something wooden or plastic that's gonna help get all of those air bubbles out. You're not gonna be able to get every single little air bubble out but do your best to get all of the big ones out. It will affect your head spacing. And like I said, head spacing is important. So a quick note on head spacing and why it is important. 
As the jars are heated during canning, air is driven out of the jar and the food inside, and the vacuum seal is formed as the jars cool. When using too much or too little headspace, the processing time may not drive all the air out of the jar, preventing the jars from sealing safely and properly. So improper headspace can alter the heat up and cool down time enough to cause underprocessing. It can also affect heat penetration inside the jar. So incorrect headspace also causes siphoning, boil over, failed seals, and contamination within the jar. Make sure to properly measure your headspace. This jar here, I had put just a little bit too much liquid in, so you can just take it right back on out until it meets that proper headspace of one inch for these recipes. Each recipe you use, you need to check and see what the recommended headspace is. Okay, all of our jars are in the canner, ready to go. I already had that two inches of water in the canner. Uh, it came up to about halfway up the jars. Like I said, this is not like water bath canning. You do not want them submerged in water. So um, I have four recipes in here. And the reason that I can do that is number one, they all need to be pressure canned. And number two, they all have the same amount of processing time. They all need an hour and 30 minutes at pressure in this canner. So that works out great. I'm gonna get my lid on and show you how I do that. So I need to find, there's a little, I have my canner on backwards. I need to turn my canner around because there's this little indent right here and that needs to be in line with this arrow right here. So we are going to make sure that is in line and you want to make sure that the lid is level so there's the same amount of space in between here all the way around all right that looks good so now that our lid is properly positioned it is level all the way across i'm going to start to tighten the screws so you tighten the ones that are directly opposite each other at the same time i'm going to tighten them just until I meet resistance so that I'm not tightening one more than the other. So they're both meeting resistance against the lid. So now I'm going to turn them until I can't turn them anymore. And then I'm gonna do the same for the other ones. So doing the ones opposite each other at the same time until you meet resistance and then go further. All right, you guys, I have my lid securely fastened, triple checked everything. I always make sure things are locked in place. It's level, everything is tightened as tight as I can get it. Um, most of the time that you hear of accidents happening with these, most likely it's operator error. Uh, people get complacent, lazy with it. Um, you really need to maintain a certain level of respect for a piece of equipment like this that could potentially be dangerous. You are the operator. You need to make sure you're operating it correctly and safely. So always triple check everything. You do that and you're golden. So other than that, I am now getting this up to a boil. I have it over medium high heat. I am going to wait for a steady stream of steam to start venting right here from this vent. And once it is a steady stream, I'm gonna set the timer for 10 minutes, allow it to vent for that time, and then I can put on my weight and bring it up to the correct amount of pressure. So that's what we're gonna do now. Okay, hopefully you can catch that on camera. There is a steady stream of steam coming out of that vent. There's no breaks in it. So now that I have that steady stream, I'm going to set my timer for 10 minutes, allow it to vent for that time, and then I am going to put on my weight. Okay, the timer is up. So I'm gonna take my weight and I need the 10 pounds. Sorry, my kids are playing. The 10 pound marking here and I'm gonna just slide that on top. Now that our weight is on, the pressure here is gonna start to rise. As soon as it hits 10 pounds of pressure, 
this weight is going to start to jiggle. And you want to maintain about four jiggles per minute. It's gonna jiggle for a few seconds and then stop. Um, you don't want it to be jiggling constantly. Now this is going to take some adjustment on the temperature of your burner. When I started pressure canning, what I did in order to gain some confidence and figure out the whole process and understand how to keep my burner on my stovetop at the correct temperature to keep the right amount of pressure, I just started canning some water. So I'd fill up my jars with water, put the lids on, and throw them in here. Um, and I would kind of experiment with it and play with the temperature until I figured out where the sweet spot was on my stovetop to keep the pressure where it needed to be. If your pressure drops below what you need, you have to start the process all over again. And you also don't want your pressure too high and you don't want this weight jiggling crazy. So it does take um, some trial and error and I found the best way to do that is just with some water so that you're not potentially wasting food and time and money because you're not so sure how to make this work just yet. So I would encourage you just to use some water, give it a trial run, and figure out where your sweet spot is on your burner to maintain the proper amount of pressure. All right, so now that we've got a jiggle, I'm gonna go back here, adjust my temperature to my sweet spot, and I am going to set my timer for 90 minutes. I'm just gonna let that go. I definitely don't leave like I'm in and around the kitchen. You don't have to necessarily stand there and watch it and baby it, but you do wanna check up on it. You wanna listen for that jiggle and make sure it's maintaining around four jiggles per minute. If it starts going crazy and you hear lots of jiggling, then maybe you need to lower your temperature a little bit. You just wanna make sure it's not dropping below the needed amount of pressure. For me, it's 10 pounds. If it goes below that 10 pounds of pressure, then I have to start my processing time all over again, which I don't want because that can end up in a lot of mushy food. So I'm going to watch it carefully, but I'm not going to stand there and baby it. Um, I am probably gonna use this time, I'm gonna get started on dinner, and then when my processing time is up, I will show you guys what I do next. Okay, our processing time finished. All I'm going to do right now is turn off this burner. I'm not gonna touch anything else on the canner. I'm going to allow this to come down to zero pressure naturally before we do anything else. So our pressure has dropped to zero naturally without touching anything. And I have made sure it has stayed there for about five minutes. Um, I am going to take off the weight now. It's going to be very hot. And I am going to wait about another five minutes before I remove the lid. We want to avoid any rapid change it rapid changes in temperature fluctuations that can cause um, siphoning with the liquid in the jar. So we want to avoid that. So I am going to let this sit this way for another five minutes before removing the lid. Okay, I've waited five minutes, so I'm gonna go ahead and start to loosen the lid. Now, when removing the lid, you want to remove it away from yourself. There's going to be a lot of very hot steam. So we're gonna twist it and pull up and away. You can see all the contents are still boiling. Now, I'm gonna let them sit in here for another five minutes before I remove them and put them in a place to sit overnight. So you don't want to disturb them. Um, that can disrupt the lid from sealing. So we just want to put them in a spot that is not going to be disturbed.
All right, so these guys are obviously out of the canner. They are going to sit here for the next 12 to 16 hours till tomorrow morning when I wake up. And I'm gonna check and make sure that they have all sealed. Um, and I will touch beast with you then. All right, so it is the next morning. I'm checking in on all of my jars. Each one has sealed. There's no longer any give on the lids. So I'm removing my rings and I am gonna do one last test to check them. I am going to carefully, make sure you do it over something, lift them by the lids. Make sure that there is a good tight seal. So those are all good. They're all pretty greasy. I had some siphoning happen. Sometimes it just happens. You can do everything you can to prevent it and it happens. So as long as there is at least half the amount of liquid remaining, they are safe to keep on the shelves to eat in the future. If there is less than half, you wanna treat them as leftovers and just keep them in the fridge and eat them up within a week. Same goes for if one of them did not seal, just treat it as leftovers. They will not be shelf stable. Um, the only thing to remember, if, if they have siphoned some of the liquid out, um, whatever is above the liquid here might get discolored. So it's totally safe to eat, it just might not look as appealing. I am going to get these all um, washed with some warm soapy water, label them and get them down in my pantry. So it took, um, it was about two and a half hours total. That includes processing time. The only hands-on time was only really an hour or so. So for an hour's worth of actual hands-on work, um, I have seven ready to go meals on my shelf for my family. Now, one of these jars will feed our family of four. Obviously, if you have a bigger family, you're probably gonna need to uh, use more than one at a time. But I also won't serve these on their own. So for the beef stroganoff, it'll probably go over some noodles. I'll thicken up that sauce in a skillet. Uh, the pot roast, I'll probably, I don't know, make some rice, serve with some applesauce, something like that. Chicken and gravy will go into the skillet and I will thicken up this sauce with some flour. And we're in PA Dutch territory. It's a big part of our heritage. So we're used to eating this over some waffles. And then of course the pulled pork, that's gonna be a sandwich and I'll just make some like homemade french fries with it, something like that. All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming along with me today. Hopefully you enjoyed this time in the kitchen with me. I hope that you are encouraged. You uh, feel a bit of a confidence boost just seeing how simple and safe this process is so you too can get some of these convenience meals on your pantry shelf. If you have any questions though, feel free to drop them in the comments. I will do my best to get back to you and help you out with that. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time.